Hi. In this video, I'll be doing two things. One of the things I'll, I'll do is I'll be providing information about fantasy or free fantasy, which will help in terms, help you in terms of, you know, understanding its function and, and it'll influence your it might influence your approach to not only Mozart's C minor fantasy, which is going to be dealt with here, but also to other fantasies like those of Schubert or Chopin or you know, understanding its function. It could, it could as well influence how you understand the evolution of the fantasy and what it what it'll, will have become in the time of Liszt. And how different that will be as compared to what they were in the time of Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach or Mozart. So that's the one thing you'll be getting from this video is information about the fantasy. And the second thing I'll be doing is I'll be responding to a, something Alfred Brendel wrote in his book. I originally read it this extract in his book, Musical Thoughts and Afterthoughts, which I read probably in the mid nineties. And I found the, the extract again, and it, you know, it's in a, a different book. So I'll be responding to that too, in the course of this video. And this will be done in the form of program notes. I'll have up in the end screen a playlist of pieces I put together as in the idea of the idea of you know a program or a concert and so and these are the I'll be reading the program notes essentially which provides the information about the fantasies which addresses that what Alfred Brendel has said or written And so it'll talk about those pieces. So the pieces, the, 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 the program that I've compiled begins with Mozart's Fantasy in C minor, K475. And then that's followed by Mozart's C minor Sonata, number 14, K in C minor. K457 and following that will be Chopin's ballad first ballad in G minor opus 23 and then will come the first movement of Mozart's B flat major sonata K281 and then for the you know the dessert or the encores will be Mendelssohn's Venetian gondola song opus in F sharp minor opus 30 number one I think um, the revolutionary etude by Chopin and then finally the opus 10 number four etude by Chopin so here here it is <laughs> Alfred Brendel, in his book, Music, Sense and Nonsense, collected essays and lectures, included the following, which he wrote in 1990 about recitals and programs. I would accept no hard and fast rule in program making except one, that works in the same key should not follow one another. A varied succession of keys is required to stimulate the listener's attention. If the whole recital does not have a true key scheme, its sequence of pieces should at least be checked for suitability. I maintain, as Arthur Schnabel did, that it is a mistake to connect in performance Mozart's C minor fantasy K475 with the C minor sonata K457. The fact that they were published in one volume proves nothing. Each of these works is an autonomous masterpiece. Together, they cancel each other out. 
So that's what Alfred Brendel says. So from this statement, I deduce that it was both Alfred Brendel and Arthur Schnabel's belief and understanding that if it's a C minor fantasy, then what one is listening to is C minor. And since the Sonata K457 is another work in the same key, that playing them back to back would be, so to speak, a case of having too much of a good thing. Right off the bat, I have to interrupt my intended discourse to first mention a detail. Given the degree to which it popped out at me immediately after locating and rereading the aforementioned extract. That already begins refuting Al and Art's claim and that will have them already squirming in their seats. Having to already start facing the music before the music itself has even been faced. There is no key signature in K475. That is, there are no sharps or flats written in at the beginning of each line after the clefs. C minor is indicated solely by accidentals. Why is that? What are its implications? Imagine Mozart watching and waiting for what your answer will be, taking exception to such an assertion about assertion about his work and works, ready to turn it into an issue of who the more intelligent one is, you or him. Imagine how important your answer would be under such perhaps even intimidating circumstances, where you suddenly discover humility and wish you'd have had it earlier and where you'd wish Alfred Brendel and especially Arthur Schnabel who put you there in that predicament would have had it. Because just as you'd have been the victim of Alfred in that scenario, repeating his claim, Alfred is the victim of Arthur. The only key signature in the score is that of B flat major in the Andantino section. So if one wanted to determine the key of the piece by looking at the opening key signature in isolation, one could only suggest those keys with no sharps or flats namely C major or A minor. But aside from that, since to the two role of honor representatives, the absence of a key signature seems to bear no relevance in their talk about the key of the piece, it would still mean that despite what they might deem relevant or irrelevant, they would have still had to have looked or listened further in order to determine the tonality. If they weren't just basing the official conclusion you heard here on something like the fantasy being generally referred to as Mozart's C minor fantasy. So how far did they look? Now here's some information about the a fantasy. In a fantasy, one will modulate to other keys more profusely than tends to happen in other pieces. A key is established with which one begins and ends. And as little as one can undertake remote and extensive modulations in regular pieces, whose structures are more set and which are composed to a strict beat, as bland a fantasy sounds that remains in neighboring keys. Yeah, so. In a fantasy, mod modulation is is the thing, and where whereas you know if in a in a sonata or something, if you start m doing wild modulations and going all over the place, it'll you know you can't do it because you're you're just like in a in a you know in in a, any arc or narrative, you have to like there's has to be you need segues, you need it all to join. There needs to, you have to establish a, an arc. When you do that in a fantasy, um, the fantasy becomes bland. The fantasy needs that modulation. Whereas it's rather counterproductive. It'll make 
a, a, a sonata or something like that, you know, the, the coherency will be gone. So that's what, that's, that's one of the informations about a fantasy. So modulation is the key. Also, there is a kind of free fantasy that is seen as a prelude, which is there to not only prepare the audience and their ears for the principal key to come by well etching it in their memory, but is also there to prepare the listeners for the content of the following piece. And its design will be determined by the characteristics of said piece to be performed. Meaning such fantasies, their entire conception, completely rebut you know who's autonomous claim. So that's part of the function of a fantasy or a free fantasy is it's preparing the key for the listeners. And as, as I go on, as I read on, you'll, under, you'll, you'll get evidence of, of, of the difference that makes when, when you have set the, the scene or, or created context, how, how that can enhance features that would, were you to listen to it cold, like a, a sonata cold, um, there'll be certain elements of it that'll just have no effect because you haven't been warmed up to the key you're listening to. So you can't appreciate any of the, any, uh, anything of what happens within that tonality or within the, that range. So, so this is information about the function of the fantasy and, and that'll help in your interpretation. So to digress again, just as some food for thought, Mozart will have performed many such free fantasies before any number of his sonatas and will have begun and ended those fantasies in the corresponding sonatas keys if it was not a modulating fantasy. So if the sonata Mozart was going to perform is in D major, well then the fantasy he will have performed before playing the sonata will as well be in D major. So it'll have begun and ended in D major, preparing the audience for that key of D. And the modulating fantasy will be one that, um, that that's a fantasy that doesn't begin and end in the same key. So that'll begin in one key and end in another. And that might be when you wanna link, you know, take, take the audience out of the world of C minor, let's say, and bring them into the world of, you know, A major. That could be to, 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 to smoothen that, that gap. And a modulating fantasy, I'll be referring to it later on. So it helps that I mentioned it here. So that's, that's what Mozart will have done. He'll have performed many such free fantasies. And the only difference of those to K475 would be is that those ones will have come straight out of his head or from his musical soul <laughs> in that moment. And there'll exist no record of them. So that's the only difference. I mean, yeah. And there'll be no record of them. Even prior to this C minor sonata, on the different occasions where Mozart might have performed it, he'll have conjured up assorted free fantasies, all of them C minor fantasies, that is beginning and ending in C minor. And I could imagine that at least some of the content of what I would guess to be the more formal and official version he later recorded could have easily evolved from things he'd stumble upon, if you will, in those earlier iterations. By definition, his writing it down does make it more official than the ones he didn't write down. And even though I think K475 will have been an accurate representation of his fantasizing skills and of what his audience would have had the privilege to behold live, 
he would have still at the same time been silly not to optimize it given its permanence. So what might that hint at regarding Mozart's intention with the work he provided us? You know, what might have his intention be? His audiences will have had the privilege of hearing him fantasize in C minor before he began that C minor fantasy and that fantasy will have differed you know from the one he's it won't be the same as the one he's written down it'll he'll have you know it, he'll have come up with it extemporaneously <laughs> if that's the word you know it'll kind of he'll have made it up in his head in in the spot and there'll, there'll be a countless number of those that there's no existence of them anymore and Mozart is dead so he's providing that live experience with this fantasy for us for those now who didn't get that chance before I go on Besides the two works being autonomous masterpieces, I'd like to recap on another detail from the extract. Alfred wrote that a varied succession of keys is required to stimulate the listener's attention. That is why he and Arthur both maintain that one shouldn't play K475 and K457 back to back. Mozart establishes the principal key of C minor in the first two bars. In bar three, he leaves C minor, never to return till bar 166 of a piece consisting of 181 bars. 14 bars, rounding it off, because what does accuracy matter? in a lilliput society of naught but experts from top to bottom, where the egregious errors committed by the role of honour go not only unidentified, but are received with cheers, applause and adoration. Only 14 bars of an 181 bar piece are actually in C minor. What does that mean? And there are only three full cadences in C minor whereas the last of them is a direct repeat of the second, both of which playing out in the last two bars. So he leaves C minor in bar three, and he doesn't return to it till bar 166. That's 163 bars without C minor. Brendel and Schnabel as representatives of the intellectual wing of Lilliput's role of honour, exposed themselves in that opening extract as having no conception of what a fantasy is, of its function or of keys. From the statement one can deduce how oblivious the keys they actually are when they can listen to the fantasy and say, in effect, that to follow with K457 would be enough C minor to cancel it out. That means entirely. You know, if I was to say it would be enough C minor to entirely cancel it out, the entirely, the word entirely would be redundant because cancelling out itself means entirely. That's, yeah. yeah. Consider this, Alfred and anyone. The fact that both works were published in the one volume may not prove anything, but it could be one more piece of the puzzle that could eventually end up fitting once the correct answer has been found. By taking into account the exact reputations the role of honour enjoy with regard to the standards implied by those reputations, their unmasking gives the expression tone deaf new meaning. I would like it if the full irony of this wasn't to go lost. Considering what a cudgel, you know, the musician's ear is. 
you know, how it's used as a cudgel to, to, to destroy, you know, the meek. It shows they are as unable to express tonality in their playing as are all the others in the cage in Lilliput. Do you too want to be a metronome that knows only notes, that only considers it C minor because the title Fantasy in C minor says it's so? In reality, Mozart with K475 is giving you a mere taste of C minor. Your ear is teased by the key and it longs for the payoff. What's been stirred is an appetite for a hearty C minor meal with all the trimmings. That is its closely related keys. But back to the fantasy. Already in bar three, in a stark move, Mozart moves to F minor or is a B flat minor. He goes to D flat major, B flat minor, E flat minor, B major, D major, F minor, then for a brief moment in bar 14, with a seventh chord over the G bass, one could perhaps think of C minor, but in the next moment, on a bar by bar basis, he's back to E flat minor, B major, B minor, and then from B minor, in his first bait and switch move, Mozart turns, Mozart turns to G major, and spends three bars, and they would be 18 to 20, hinting at a formal cadence in that key, which is the dominant harmony of C minor. But this was trickery, mere bait, and with a switch, he's back to D, B minor, and through an even longer, strong establishment of a formal cadence in that tonality, Mozart is posing to, this time seriously, modulate into that key of B minor only to, yet again, take a different turn. So instead of B minor, the first key in which Mozart formally settles is D major, which, with its two sharps, can be counted among what would be referred to as C minor's most remote keys. And with all this trickery, one might think Mozart a scamp, a dirty, rotten louse, if he hadn't d have done it so beautifully smoothly and given you the feeling while doing it of being the most special person in the world. <laughs> but I'll leave that for yourselves to judge. Yeah, so, you know, he's, he, he, you, you think, right, we're, we're going to be minor. And then he does, you know, he throws the curveball and he, he goes instead into G major and he spends three bars you know, they're very, you sort of, one of those bars that stick out. You know, he's, he's, he's hinting that he's going, this is where he's settling into G major. But what does he do? He does the, the old switcheroo again. And then he's back to B minor. So you're, you, it's like the second attempt. And he's going, right, so now this time, seriously, I'll be going into B minor. You know, now serious. And so you, you, you let your guard down, you, 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 you accept, right, B minor it's going to be. And what does he do? He throws, he throws the curveball again and, and you're in D major. So, and this, by the way, foreshadows a similar turn in K457's second movement in bar 31, where Mozart pretends to be formally modulating into E flat minor but then switches to G flat major. He's preparing us for the content of, you know, what's to come. These, this is more information about the fantasy now. These sensible deceptions belong to the beauties of a fantasy. And as a listener, and now here's how, you know, you could listen to it. like some maybe advice or whatever to you know because this is not m meant to alienate anybody this is to you know to help help you kind of discover your potential 
So as a listener and how to listen to it, you don't necessarily have to know what key Mozart is in, but you could notice with the opening strains of the piece, for example, there is constant change to be heard without any evidence of a cadence. And all of those changes will feel unpredictable. Some will be striking, like bars nine to 10, where Mozart goes from E flat minor to B major. And when you do hear a formal cadence being established, which, which you will, you, when, when you know to, to listen for it, you will hear, hear that then you could, for yourself, anticipate the main chord of that cadence as being the new key in which time will be spent. And this will be how the audience of Mozart will have listened and, and, and how they'll have understood it and heard it. So they might not need you know, all these things like they talk about like perfect pitch and all that sort of stuff, but they can hear, okay, there's, it's, it's, it's always changing. The music and, and it doesn't seem to be settling anywhere I haven't heard that cadence I know and that cadence that five chord will go to the one chord and so when it doesn't they'll go hold on a sec what's this what's going on here this is something different so you can be listening to it in that same way as they will have listened to it and then appreciate the beauties of the fantasy and, and enjoy being deceived and, and, and being led, led in one direction only for it to suddenly take a turn. So that's a way that when, you know, if you do click on the, the playlist, how you can listen to it and, and, and take part in that. So incidentally, this D major theme evokes the opening of the second movement of the sonata. One could notice their similarities, like they create similar silhouettes or cast similar shadows. Incidentally, the fantasy anticipates more than I can mention in these program notes. So such things lie waiting to be discovered while listening to the concert, like an Easter egg hunt. The two beginnings of the fantasy and sonata with their unison C's would be another example. You know, there's there's lots lots of things that could be no will will be noticed when you listen to it that you might go oh yeah that kind of you know and then and each time there might be something different you notice. So to close this part with regard to the opening statement, I'll leave it to you to imagine how many minutes of D we will have been listening to in that section. Minutes during which Alfred and Arthur, now caught with their ever shrinking minor C's in their hand, can further squirm and fidget. How many minutes of D? Remember, D is with its two sharps, is distant to C. C is B flat, E flat and A flat, that key signature. Uh, 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 the closely most the closest related key to C minor will be E flat major, and that has the same key signature B flat, E flat, and A flat. So you can see how close they are. And then you can imagine the key signature is C minor, and then the key signature D major, but it's F sharp and C sharp. How separate they are, or distant they are from each other. So we're, we, we have minutes of D. After two bars of C minor. The next key in the Allegro section is in bar 42 is A minor, heralding the orchestral element of the following sonata. Again, arrived at by way of some unexpected turns. We're headed for G major. No wait, E minor. No wait, it's A minor. Another key distant to C minor. Then after A minor comes a repeat of the orchestral idea in G major, the fifth of G, C minor, and the closest key to the principal key so far. I mean, we've had a lot of music 
and G minor is the closest we've come to C, C minor. So the closest key to the principal key so far, of which don't forget, despite all its mention, we've still only had two bars of. But he doesn't stay there. He modulates again. And the theme of the next larger section begins in F major and is repeated in F minor. And then again, Mozart takes off through a, di a diverse range of keys. D flat major, G flat major, E flat minor, F flat major, D flat minor, D major, B minor, C major, A minor, B flat major, G minor, A flat major, F major, E minor, D minor, C major, G minor, none of which you'll note is C minor. As well, Mozart is introducing here the triplet movement of the first movement of K457. Every time K475 anticipates the content or substance of K457, the veracity of Alfred and Arthur's claim is further eroded. C major was the closest Mozart came to a C. His flight of fancy touches ground on an F in the bass with its seven chord over it, on which he remains for quite some time, before formally arriving at B flat major, its natural conclusion. Incidentally, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach will tell you that the deceptions that make a fantasy good shouldn't always occur, so the natural doesn't remain completely hidden. And so to add my own two cents to that, one can't fully appreciate the one without the other. Or in other words, you know, like to really appreciate a shortcut, one needs to have experienced the long way round. Otherwise, the shortcut merely becomes the way and thus unremarkable. With this cadenza over the F major seventh harmony, Mozart is foreshadowing the slow movement of K457 and its final decorated format over the B flat dominant seven chord in bar 52. So every time that happens, you know, it, it, it makes that what Alfred and Arthur maintain. It, it you know, it, 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 it contests their claim or their stance or their conclusion. And one could as well wonder if that stark striking move Mozart impressed on us in bar three from B natural in the bass to those unison B flats was to prepare the way for this choice of a remote key to further smoothen its arrival. This could indicate the level at which Mozart operates. So it's like, you know, that, that first, so you, you, in bar two, you have that B, B natural. And then the B flat, when, when, he, when he begins again with the opening figure, it, it comes, it's, it's like a bit of a bump. It's like, hold on, what's this? It creates an impression. It's like, especially in, in the context of Mozart, because Mozart is so, you know, so natural and flowing. And, and, and it, it, you know, he's able to, 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 one of his talents that his, his father kind of admired in, in his son was his ability to provide, be able to provide the perfect answer to any kind of a, the perfect response to any call. You know, so you, you, you put the first two bars of anything in front of Mozart, he'll come up with the most, like what, what would seem like the most inevitable answer to those two bars. So, so this bump, you know, and it, it's, it's, it can be almost subliminal that, 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 that when we hear the B flat, which is a remote key to C, C minor, 
when we get there, it sounds so right and so smooth. And again, what you're getting, it's like when, when you think of what Carl Philip is saying about how the deceptions that make a fantasy good shouldn't always occur. You can see Mozart and Bach are standing side by side. It's exactly that. He, Mozart doesn't hide the natural and the natural comes as like one of the, you know, the best bits in the, in the, you know, the fantasy. When, 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 when you hear the natural after all those switching, switching bait moves, the deceptions that he, 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 he had been doing before that. And the bump of the beef, B flat at the start, we could subliminally be comparing that or, or unconsciously be comparing that bump to this B flat move and, and, and which will make it in relation extra smooth, extra natural. So, you know, what, what sort of a level is that that Mozart, you know, is operating on if that is the case? This section of the fantasy could be seen as an entire slow movement in B flat major. B flat major, an entire slow movement. Whose ideas, the rhythmic elements and character also foreshadow more of the ensuing sonata's middle movement. Consider bar 47 onwards, you know, if you are interested. Although the more excited orchestral interjections or passages in bars 107 to 110, for example, could be anticipating the orchestral bars 9 to 13, for example, of K457's first movement. Mozart, unfortunately, is too subtle, refined and sophisticated for the role of honor not to be underestimating him like they do. He'd need to be more on the nose to penetrate Lilliput's blind arrogance. You know, this subliminal suggestion to, to be evoking the characteristics of the piece to be performed without actually directly quoting them, without, you know, tiring the audience of it beforehand by, you know, being too on the nose. That's a level that's lost obviously on Alfred and Arthur. During this quasi slow movement, Mozart gives only the slightest tease of G minor at bar 122. 122 we're at. And a secret surreptitious whisper of C minor, I'll pretend didn't happen even though for those that consider the whole fantasy as being in C minor, it's not secret at all. For them, they see neither cat nor bag. Never mind not letting the cat out of the bag. So he, you know, he, he provides the slightest tease at G minor, which sets up this whisper of C minor. And I'll pretend didn't happen because, you know, I don't want to, it doesn't matter. So, so he does that before he modulates to that key of G minor for the next section. Again, through a pure allegro storm of virtuosity, after beginning it in G minor, Mozart goes through a number of keys before emerging from it in A flat major. And that will have been a list like the list of keys I've already, those two lists of keys I've already presented. And I won't here just because it's too much writing then. So he emerges from this storm of virtuosity in A flat major after going through a number of keys. And the A flat major, which still can't be counted among C minor's most closely related keys. And I could say here, cue Lilliput, say something intelligent Lilliput. And Lilliput could say, you know, 
uh, it's all opera. <laughs> you know, but it's not opera, it's modulation. And how much did that Lilliput Pearl of Wisdom cost you in your lessons or in master classes? And how often will the Lilliput master class giver or the professor say to, to the person, it's all opera, as if they are um, displaying some sort of a wisdom or you know, insight that that is exclusive and that they are like giving you the greatest gift in the world, telling you Mozart's all opera. It's not all opera. You can see how, 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 how inadequate that is. Everybody knows that. Everybody has heard it. They still say it like it's new information. There's not a single person who studies piano who's an interest in piano who doesn't know that, who hasn't heard it. The dogs on the street know that. Yet, they'll tell you that, still. Instead of giving you, giving you any real information. So from there, from the A flat major, Mozart goes to F minor, then G minor, and then to the seventh chord with the major third over G, the dominant of C minor. And this might be around bar 156. And for 10 bars, he teases the key of C minor, drawing it out beautifully and tantalizingly till finally, wink, wink, <laughs> 163 bars later, 163 bars later, after just two opening bars of C minor, he gives us C minor, he lands home. So, two bars of C minor. 163 bars later, he comes back to C minor. He lands home. And what is that like? It's like, you know, you know what it's like when you go on holiday or something or you take a long trip away from home and then you return and that feeling you get back when you return and that feeling you have in the first two days, that's what this trip will have been like. And if you think of Mozart and his life and the extensive traveling he did when he was a kid growing up in his formative years, imagine how familiar that feeling will be to Mozart to be gone from home and, and to come back again after a, a, a long trip, you know, and it could be that, that all this, you know, his, his experience as they're playing out in, in how he fant is fantasizing and his understanding of that feeling and here expressing it, feeling it in tonality. So, and so he lands home. And what is noticeable here is how striking and memorable the idea is. With every key characteristic of that tonal tonality condensed into that small space. And how it balances the minimal amount of time Mozart spent establishing the key in the first place. How he creates the exception to what could have been the common consensus of how one might have fantasized at the time. You know, what, 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 what might have been the advice at the time will be that if you are going to undertake extensive and far reaching modulations, which Mo, what Mozart did, that you spend a, a, a good amount of time at the beginning of the piece to establish the key before leaving it. And then a good amount of time at the end, re-establishing the piece, you know, so the audience has it in their memory for when the, 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 the actual piece in C minor begins. So he went against this. He only did two bars, which anybody, like which what people might say, now you can't do that. You can't, if you're gonna be fantasizing so much in so many keys, so far away from C minor, you have to spend longer in C minor than just two bars. 
So Mozart created the exception to that. And when one hears that, now you can see, you can hear how effective that was. How, 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 like, like it, it's, it's so memorable that you immediately recognize it, even though you only heard it once. And, and you, so you, you, it's, it's, it's there. He, he immediately kind of implanted it into your, your mind. And if you listen to how I play it and stop thinking that I can't read the score, that my knowledge of basic theory compared to yours in the role of honors is somewhat lacking and entertain the thought that perhaps I might play it like I do because there are things I know that the whole of Lilliput is ignorant to. Then you could begin to hear it as Mozart intended it to be heard and listen to him speak with the stamp of mediocrity Lilliput has gagged him with removed. Plus, I am the only piano player out there that can express tonality. And it would be one of the gifts I would have to share, but not if the value of such a gift isn't recognized. Although even now, with your attention being drawn to it, it could be that you notice your awareness of keys growing as you listen to the concert. And it does provide you a chance to hone your awareness of keys given that here is the only place you will find them properly expressed. And, you know, this is not, you know, ego or whatever speaking. What I'm doing here is that I'm informing you. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe that I can, the videos are there to be scrutinized. If you want to try and debunk them, if you want to try and, you know, kind of point out, go, ha ha, He's, he's just a chancer or he's a, a, a phony or whatever it is. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It's all there. And the, the harder, the, 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 the greater the expert you are and the more you try and wait for me to show up that I know nothing or whatever it is. I, I you know, that would make, you know, the better for me because I, I'll, I, I do everything and more. And that is what, you know, is that not who you want to be following if you're interested in learning the true way to play the piano? And you can ask, you can say to your professor, if you're going to Juilliard or an elite university, you can say to them, I want to be able to express tonality and see what they say. I don't have to provide you with the specific answer to how one expresses tonality, but they do, you're paying them. So you should use that and, and, and say, I want you to show me and listen to them say, I can't. They won't have a, an answer for you to how to do that. And they might give you some you know, waffle, which will serve, will in no way serve you, but you could say to them, well, how come you're not doing it? How come you can't express tonality in your playing? Yeah, it doesn't matter. But like the opening of the fantasy, within the space of two bars, Mozart is quick to leave, giving us an abridged version of the opening explorations before that beautiful, striking, iconic, What's cooler than cool, ice cold, cadential sequence. Prefiguring a similar harmonic phrase at the end of the third movement of K457. So this will be one of those K, you know the cadence I'm talking about. This will be one where uh, if you're performing the piece, you'll want it to, to work out. You'd be heartbroken if that didn't, you know, hit with all the impact. Now that's how good it is. This is the first full cadence in C minor we're hearing and how long how much music have we been listening to Mozart ends the fantasy establishing a formal cadence in C minor but again withholding the payoff 
deviating to F minor, employing half cadences, an interrupted cadence to the A flat major chord. And it is only in the second last bar do we get a full cadence in C minor, which is immediately repeated with an ascending C minor scale. Mozart has established the principal key of C minor, but we have never actually had C minor. How satisfying and effective will it be to now be ensconced in C minor and its closely related keys? What difference will this fantasy have made? The fantasy K475 turns the sonata K457 into an epic journey in C minor and far from each autonomous masterpiece cancelling the other out. Mozart sets up an awareness of tonality and substance, both conscious and unconscious, that will extend not only throughout the following sonata, but also throughout the whole concert, creating something that is more than just the sum of its parts. The third movement, for example, with its fermatus and its ponderous, maybe even weary musings in F minor and G minor, now seem to be harking back to the fantasy and the beginning of that journey. And despite the extensive, too many to count, wide ranging and far reaching modulations, never once did Mozart go to an actual C major chord. And aside from twice brushing off the key momentarily, where an errant A flat bass on my part in this concert cancels out the bigger of those fleet encounters, encounters, <laughs> sorry, the closest key, the closest he got was a brief sojourn in A minor. So despite the abundance of keys, all that modulating, the switch to the actual C major harmony in the development section of the first movement of the sonata, its uniqueness remains intact. And I would say becomes all the more impactful to have been able to keep a secret for that long without spoiling it. Such is an example of that synergy. Another example is how, despite the plethora of keys, the E flat major of the second movement, the relative major of C minor, and the nearest and most obvious key to go to from C minor, has hitherto gone untouched. I'm talking about the fantasy. That makes it an immaculate E flat major. Such are the details, the role of honour and their listeners, the pampered ears whose attention they want to keep with placebos and noise are oblivious to. Placebos is the, you know, it's a pill that has written on it Mozart's C minor fantasy. So they'll take it just as, as Arthur and Alfred take it, thinking it's C, they're taking C minor, but in reality, there's no C minor there. It's just a vitamin C, let's say. It's a placebo. So they're thinking C minor. That's the placebos and the noise. It's all, it's noise and notes. When you're dealing with notes, which what Alfred Arthur and the Roll of Honor deal with, it's all about notes. And you might think noise like is in banging or whatever. No, noise is the noise of those notes. Let's make these notes quieter. Let's make these notes louder. It's, it's just, it's dealing in notes and the noise of those notes. That's what Lilliput does. And you'll hear it in your lesson, your teacher telling you to get a bit quieter here, get a bit louder there and all. It, it's the volume control is dealing purely in noise and nothing else. And they won't know what is expression beyond the fortes and pianos and, and crescendos and diminuendos controlling the noise levels. Ask them that. They'll have no answer for you. They won't know and they are going to feel completely intimidated by me. And they'll tell you to stop listening to me because they won't like it. They won't like your strength. So, those details, they're listeners. They're, they're listeners, don't forget. 
according to them, why are they not playing the, the, those two works back to back? Because their listeners' attention won't be stimulated. Do you remember how many keys we have been listening to, how many remote keys? There is less C minor in that fantasy than there might be in an F major sonata by Mozart. Yet their audience members, their attention isn't stimulated. All these things, subtle, like it doesn't get more sophisticated and, and subtle, uh, like how Mozart is, what he's doing. He's, 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 he is operating on a level of like subliminal, just unconscious and unconscious. He's not laboring points. Everything you hear in that sonata is new, despite the fact that he's been pre preparing all of it. So Alfred and Arthur, with that statement, are essentially throwing Mozart's work back at him in his face under the, I'll say unconscious, arrogant, typical Lilliput arrogance, condescending guise of, oh, they're such masterpieces that, that will save them for the, each for their own special occasion. That's what they're doing there, unwittingly, you know, because they don't forgive them because they don't know what they do. Then it could be that the opening of Chopin's Ballad Opus 23 will come as a shock. We've been so grounded, given such a secure footing in C minor, that if one forgets, if one is allowing oneself to forget and be taken and led by the music, one could immediately think, what, more, more C minor, you know? And it might sound as if Chopin is responding directly to the fantasy itself. I would see this as one of the extra novel surprises such a program provides. The ballad's opening is not so clear cut harmonically, and it is as if, by leaving out the bass, Chopin himself is not so sure as to what key he is in. So it muddies his arrival at the C minor chord, makes it more ambiguous, wishy-washy, as if he has one foot in G minor and the other in C minor and can't decide. But from there he does choose G minor and he begins his own journey in that key eventually whip building on and giving his answer to the virtuosic G minor storm Mozart whipped up in his fantasy. So yeah, that, that beginning, and I find that kind of, it strikes me every time that it's almost, the, the opening of that ballad will be so familiar to people, you know, to everybody who know, you know, is interested in piano. And to, to hear it kind of new is, you know, I, th I think it's, it's interesting of what hearing it in this context that that brings that out. And I mentioned a modulating fantasy. One could consider that opening as a sort of a mini modulating fantasy. And that, you know, Chopin, that he went from listening, from experiencing that fantasy and sonata right to his response and, and 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 Chopin is doing exactly that what a modulating fantasy will have done taking the listener out of the key they've been listening to and bringing them to a new key you know so that that I think is is interesting and I don't know if I should say it but you know the way they talk about a Neapolitan sixth chord? That Neapolitan sixth, that's used as well to, to make you feel bad about yourself, to make you feel inferior. And, and it's, it's, it's almost, it's, it's again a cudgel. And there is nothing more lily put than a Neapolitan sixth chord. And if you have the insight, You know, somebody going on YouTube or whatever, talking about the Neapolitan six chord as if it, you know, it makes them so insightful and, and knowledgeable about music. 
they have no idea of, they are basically screaming from the rooftops, I'm a complete idiot. Because it's like the emperor's new clothes. That is a Lilliput invention. It's, it, it bears no relevance to anybody in the world of music. And they have no idea that that is what they're doing. It's the equivalent of um, walking around with your trousers pulled down to your ankles, clutching a, you know, a potted plant and sucking your thumb. And that's what the equivalent of that, that is, doing that. So any of that talk about the Neapolitan six chord, you can see big Lilliput giveaway. And they, 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 they wouldn't dream of doing it in a, in a million years if they knew just how stupid it makes them look going on. And, and that's why you, you feel like, I don't know if you feel bad, but I would feel bad listening to that because it's nonsense. They can't, it, 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 it's nonsense and that's why it doesn't go down well it has a like a, a bitter taste to it it doesn't it doesn't give you anything it's it's information that's meant to feel make you feel lost and and like you know nothing it's pure lily put it was it was come up by a lily put person in the cage and it exists in the cage and it does not exist in the world of music and i'll just say about that and you will never hear bach talk about a neapolitan six chord and you can decide is bach the idiot or because he doesn't talk about it or is is is, is, is bach less intelligent than them because they're talking about the neapolitan six chord but they'll say none of this they'll know none of this Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and finally, for this program, with the masterful first movement of the B-flat major sonata, K281, one of the responses I had after its first full B-flat major cadence, after listening to these pieces in this order, was me wondering, with the ballads opening and the modulating fantasizing of it, if you will, with the stormy G minor coda, was this not Mozart all along? That's what I was thinking. It was like the like the, the ultimate ruse, you know, like in the films where, you know, or like the usual suspects, you know, where Mozart was the mastermind behind it all. So that was my, um, that was the re response I had. And K281 is a reprise of B flat major. First it was Andantino, now it is Allegro. And if one thinks of the triadic movement, if that is a term, we have gone from C minor to E flat major, K four seven five or K four five seven second movement, to G minor of the ballad, to B flat major, all moving up in leaps of a third and all keys related to C minor. And B flat major, together with the E flat major of that same movement, then feels to me to be up above, expanding or soaring on higher ground. All thanks to the fantasy. For dessert, uh, I'll call them dessert since encores, I figure, have to be requested. The gondol lead, I find, fits nicely. If you've been following the voices, the various lines of the writing as I present them, which I would recommend you do as an attentive listener using your imagination, which the piano unfortunately demands, but which the singing style will reward, you will really be able to appreciate Mendelssohn's simple singing line. To me, it's like he is bidding farewell to the world of music and at the same time mourning its loss, seeing tragedy in the smallest of things. So a whirlpool in the waters of the canal will be small in the eyes of everyone else present, but to Mendelssohn and the state of mind he's in, it's massive, it's all he sees. And I would wonder, while F-sharp minor could come as something unrelated and therefore out of place, considering F-sharp major is the dominant of B major, 
or more relevantly, B minor, since B minor played a sizable role early on in the fantasy. Would F sharp minor have some relationship then to B flat major when one thinks of distance and the shrinking of F sharp's major third, the A sharp to A natural, and the B natural of B minor with its third D to B flat of B major with its third D? Is there some relation there as far as distance is concerned? That both F sharp major and B minor are being pulled each in some way in the same direction to become F sharp minor and B flat major. But they're just, you know, rambling thoughts. <laughs> and for the second dessert item, we return to C minor with the revolutionary etude. And it is possible, after all we've been through, that it, come, that it could come over differently. And the effects of the fantasy are still being felt. And that one notices more than one might have if one had been listening to Opus 10 number 12 in isolation. And hears it not as an etude of fast notes, but is better able to hear its harmony, which is important to do for everyone's own sake, because of the difference a healthy, realistic relationship to these pieces by Chopin makes compared to the opposite, a dysfunctional, delusional, toxic, soul-destroying relationship. One your sweet-voiced, smooth-talking, patient-exuding, tip-giving, on top of it all, Lilliput hacks will cultivate and nurture to your detriment. Perhaps, too, it will feel like one final welcome return to the key with which we've gone through so much. And finally comes the C-sharp minor A2, opus 10, num number 4. Because let us not dwell, let us move on, and not have C minor weigh us down when we want to set our minds to other things. Again, perhaps in this piece, thanks to Mozart, you will be better able to hear the harmony and what that reveals. So I, I put those pieces at the end because this, it is an opportunity. If you do find yourself listening and finding your your awareness of tonality or the keys growing or, or increasing and that you do start to hear for yourself those things I've been talking about in these notes well this could provide uh, this could be a chance to to hear those pieces by Chopin as they are because if they're not properly understood or or you know um observed or, or seen what they are is a is a you know a fabrication or a, a, a you know something fictional they don't exist in reality and 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 it and, and and if you're chasing an ideal that doesn't even exist that is exactly that dangling carrot that you will never reach because what it is you're chasing and what it is those like people on a like a, a Chopin jury or something they don't see Chopin for who he really is they haven't they don't even know who he is they, and, and they present they present an, a, an, an idea of Chopin that doesn't exist in reality and, and it, that'll it, can, it will never be achieved because it, it doesn't exist it's it exists only in the cage and it, it is that dangling carrot and who does that dangling carrot work on it works on donkeys <laughs> I could say things about Chopin's pieces that you know they're like I, I, some of the stuff I'd have up my sleeve, you know, as the like the big guns to take some of these experts down. You know, they have no idea exist and, and would, you know, if I was to, to hit them with that, it would be the equivalent like of executing your general with an anti-aircraft gun. That's how, how powerful it would be. 
and I'll just I'll keep them up my sleeve but I, I include them it's a chance here to um, if you are hearing harmony more or, or keys more tonality more because of this concert because of the fantasy there's a chance to hear some of that in those pieces and that's not to say Chopin isn't a genius or anything. I'm not saying that, or I'm not saying Chopin is bad or anything. It's just see him, see him as he is, see him for what he is and not some sort of a, a, a made up fantasy land fairy tale ideal that has nothing to do with reality. And with regard to Alfred Brendel's opening statement, and so I, I say that, you know, on a certain level, given the type of person he is, I'd also have feelings of compassion for him. And I have heard that he has him say, or, you know, that, that, he doesn't necessarily hold those views anymore of the fantasy and the sonata about performing them. But to me that, so I'll say that. And, and the, 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 so the book the, I got this from was his book, Music, Sense and Nonsense, Collected Essays and Lectures. So I don't, didn't read that book. I got that off the internet, found it on the internet because I remembered it from reading it in his other book. And it could be that he, you know, that, that that belongs to the nonsense. And he says that he knows now that what he wrote then was nonsense because it is nonsense. But it's nonsense that was kind of endorsed by Lilliput, by the role of honor, that you'll have had you know, I'll, I'll bet there will have been occasions where a, a student will have taught, I, I might perform, you know, the fantasy and then the Mozart sonata after it. And then uh, some professor or some clever clogs will tell them, oh, no, you shouldn't. They shouldn't be performed together because they're just parroting this, what they read there. And I'll bet that happened on, on occasions and or, you know, or, or just anybody, you know, Button in saying, no, you shouldn't do that. Why? Do you have no clue why? Oh, because they're, they're both in the same key and you shouldn't have works in the same key following each other. You know, and, and so that was represented, endorsed, represented, published as, and, and I remember in, in, in university or college that, um, you know, the Lilliput professor saying how you know, it worked before, you know, in the 60s or earlier where where it was just enough to have talent. Like if you're a singer, it was just enough to have a beautiful voice, a great voice. And but nowadays the musicians are expected to be more academic, more scholarly, clever and, and know more, you know, like with regard musicology or whatever. <laughs> And that that same level of just getting by and your talent wouldn't cut it anymore. And one of the artists that the, the, the professor cited was Alfred Brendel. And so, you know, and, and, and you, can, you can see from that, the, the complete lack of scholarship or insight or anything. It's, it's, it's all just, it's just a pose. It's just a you know, an outfit that's put on and everybody says, oh, intelligent, intellectual, insightful, wise, but it's not, it's completely ignorant. You know, so that's, that's what that was representing back then. So that's why it's still relevant now. And Arthur Schnabel, he went his whole career, his life, he didn't retract that. Otherwise, if he had retracted that, Alfred Brendel wouldn't have said that Arthur Schnabel maintains this. And he's another one, you know, who 
have his editions he'll done editing work all this will be seen as knowledgeable but he was a a massive dope he was a massive dope he was Lilliput he was yeah so regard to the opening statement and should I repeat it here would it now be seen in a new light would it strike you how shallow, empty, and I don't know, destitute or meager or paltry or, you know, like food that, that has no nourishment to it. It's just empty. I don't know what the word is. Non-nutritious. Life in the cage actually is. And would you better recognize its inherent, insidious, offensive arrogance? Because arrogance is not your friend. Arrogance is your enemy. You know, um, Shakespeare called the, you know, jealousy a green-eyed monster that mocks the meat upon which it feeds. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. But you could call arrogance the, you know, the, this, this, the sweet-talking monster that charms the meat on which it feeds. Arrogance is not arrogance what people understand. It's like, oh, I'm great. Everybody else is stupid. I'm great. That's not arrogance. Arrogance is insidious. It's, it disguises itself. Arrogance might, you might feel arrogance as being magnanimous or, um, you know, like it, it, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Arrogance is not obvious and arrogance stops you from evolving, stops you from learning, stops you from realizing things, from discovering. Because arrogance, you know, so arrogance is dangerous. So would, would, would it all be more obvious now after everything that I've talked about? And I can read it once more just to see. I would accept no hard and fast rule in program making except one that works in the same key should not follow one another. A varied succession of keys is required to stimulate the listener's attention. If the whole recital does not have a true key scheme, its sequence of pieces should at least be checked for suitability. I maintain, as Arthur Schnabel did, that it is a mistake to connect in performance Mozart's C minor fantasy K475 with the C minor sonata, K457. The fact that, that they were published in one volume proves nothing. Each of these works is an autonomous masterpiece. Together, they cancel each other out. What do you get from that? What information, what insight, what can you use from that? You can see it, 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 it provides nothing. You might think, well, it's only an extract. Maybe he, he explains more. No, he doesn't explain more. It, he just talks about other elements of concert, you know, program building and whatever. And why is there not more? Because if, if there was more there, he wouldn't have said that in the first place. Because it's, it's like he picked the two most ridiculous pieces to say they don't belong together to say they don't belong together. You know, he's talking about uh, stimulate listeners attention. You need a, you know, like a variety of keys to stimulate a various, a varied succession of keys to stimulate the listener's attention. You can see the, that, those listeners are the, the, the pampered ear that Bach is talking about. Because none of those listeners, they, they'll all tell everybody, don't put the fantasy and the sonata back to back because all those listeners are fans of Alfred Brendel. They'll all lap up whatever he tells them. So they'll repeat it, regurgitate that. The attentive listener. And... I would say this though, the audience of Mozart, it's, it's in the likes of Mozart or Beethoven or Bach, where the, 
you know, players that are able to express tonality where they can appreciate that. The the treffers, you know, the fast players by profession of the day, or the, the treffers, you know, those who hit all the right notes, they just as they are today will be the same in box time. They will not be able to express tonality in their playing. So there will be nothing there. The keys are irrelevant with those players because they only deal in notes. And so it, 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 that all wouldn't matter to them. But it is the very succession of the keys is the thing that um, a person listening to Mozart will most appreciate from that fantasy. Yeah, so, so that statement, it makes me think of a, a scene in Annie Hall, you know, where they're queuing in line to see a film and, and there's a, like a loud, obnoxious professor behind Woody Allen and Diane Keaton talking about, you know, how indulgent the filmmaker is of the film they're gonna see. And, you know, Mozart, or Woody Allen says the key, you know, key word here is indulgent. <laughs> and he goes, he steps out and addresses the, the camera and the professor follows him out and they're, they're, they're arguing. And then Woody Allen, he fetches the actual film director of the film they're going to see and brings him out and the film director addresses the obnoxious Lilliput professor and says to him that he knows nothing of his work and how he ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. And then upon which Woody Allen addresses the audience through the camera and says, boy, if life were only like this. <laughs> you know, if you could only hear what Bach, Mozart or Beethoven would have to say to Lilliput's role of honor. So is that it then? Has Lily put one forever? With all its minions, all its metro gnomes? Because they are the cage. I would have feelings of compassion. for Alfred Brendel because you know he'll have you know he'll have worked hard and I I could imagine him you know let's say he's preparing the C minor sonata or the fantasy and if you ask him do you enjoy it or that I could imagine he might say well and I could imagine he enjoys it on a certain level and he appreciates he can admire and appreciate Mozart's genius and stuff but I could imagine him thinking that in terms of practice and, and, and the work that needs to be done to prepare for a, a performance that enjoyment doesn't come into it that he can't you know it's work because he has to you know get every movement down so he he does all the movements he needs to do to get it right to play it like he wants to play it and you know, whereas I don't have to work on any movement whatsoever, I don't have to think of a single movement that I make. So, you know, and, and, and despite all that, the work that he has to do, he doesn't get to be in the world of music. His, he's still in the cage. And I could imagine he would like to be in the world of music. He'd like to experience you know, he'd like to play Mozart and hear Mozart's voice come out of them or Beethoven or Schubert or any of these people. And he doesn't get that. And I could imagine he'd like, he'd, 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 he'd like to experience that. And, and, you know, so, so on that level, I'd, um, You know, I think that he's, he's uh, genuine 
on the whole. You know, so so I would I would, I'd, I'd you know I I I wouldn't I wouldn't be against him escaping the cage, whereas there'd be others where I think the cage is the perfect place for them, and I wouldn't ever want to see them leave. You know, so so on that level, and you know. Whereas in other levels, I don't feel sorry for him at all, where he should be rather feeling sorry for me, you know, in terms of success and all that sort of thing. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll just say that in reference. But that extract is nonsense. And... And I'll, I'll include this, this was too big to fit. I'll put this in the description of the, you know, the playlist, but I, it won't, it's, it's too big for the, for the playlist. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll continue it in the description of each piece then in the playlist till I get it all down. Hopefully it fits in. So you could read it there yourself. And I would say, there is more to be gained from this than might meet the eye than one might think on a surface level. So, it's there anyway, if you're interested. <laughs>